All right, more with uh, differential equations today. Before we get into the content, which includes some application to cash flow and mixing problems, I do want to remind you that in these notebooks, I have this section here called What is Calculus? We looked at this the first day of the class. And in that section, I've got both perspectives of applied mathematicians and scientists and pure mathematicians. And I do have some code in here that's pretty interesting. There was the uh, predator prey code in this one. That was my favorite bit of code. This one is a discrete model, it's not continuous. This is the one where the uh, purple dots are rabbits and the orangish dots are foxes, and the foxes are eating the rabbits. I enjoy working at that. You can tweak the parameters and see what happens. Different values of these things affect what happens. And that's something that's kind of of utmost interest to people who study this stuff is what happens as parameters change. Here's a continuous predator-prey model. We'll look at this one on Friday. Here, we are keeping track of the rabbits and fox population using a continuous model using differential equations. The hash thing here is what the initial condition is. Wherever I put this, the coordinates of that point are the starting number of rabbits, probably in thousands of rabbits, and the starting number of foxes, maybe in hundreds of foxes. And as time goes by in this predator prey model, the populations oscillate. You get what's called a periodic orbit. The solution curve comes back to where it started. Does that happen in real life? Probably not, but it's certainly interesting. And it would be interesting if, if it happened even approximately in real life. A couple important dots that you see there, those are called equilibrium solutions. They are analogous to equilibrium solutions for the differential equations you've been studying so far. Differential equations can be applied to planetary motion. What do I have here? I've got the motion of a couple of fictitious planets around a fictitious sun or star. The blue one looks like a circular orbit. The red one looks like an elliptical orbit, an oval, not a, not a circle. These orbits satisfy something called Kepler's laws, which I'm not going to get into today. Maybe, maybe if we have a little time next week, I'll mention what they are. But differential equations can be used used to um, figure out what's going on with those. Remember the sound waves that you can play with Mathematica? Let's play this one. So you have sound waves, and depending on what the uh, frequency is of the omega here, And this is called a beating phenomenon. We've got, it gets more intense than less intense, etc. The amplitude oscillates in strange ways. And here is what that phenomenon looks like in another graphical picture that doesn't include the sound. That's with differential equations as well. And you can look at some of these other ones. Maybe we'll look at them on Friday and next Monday. They're all areas of applications of differential equations. All right, for today, though, we want to actually do some problems now. Let's start with cash flow problem. Cash flows can be modeled with different equations, too, at least in certain circumstances. Pretend you've got a bank account, and your initial deposit Well, let's pretend you're pretty rich, and it's $100,000. I don't have $100,000 to deposit. Okay, I don't. I'm not rich. But pretend you are for the sake of argument. You got $100,000 you deposited in a bank account that is earning interest. And to keep things relatively simple as far as the differential equation is concerned, let's assume it's continuously compounded interest. So we use E. Let's 
say, 2% annual interest rate. Compounded continuously. Let's also say you withdraw money from that. Maybe it's not really a bank. Maybe it's, I don't know, some other investment vehicle. And you're withdrawing money from that continuously as well. Now, does anybody ever draw, withdraw money continuously? Probably not. I mean, maybe companies do to a certain degree. They got enough money that they can kind of withdraw money continuously. That might be something they could do. People typically don't. But let's just say, for the sake of argument, to keep things simple, that you withdraw money continuously. Meaning, every second of every day, even every millisecond of every day, at a rate of, well, let's say $1,000 per year. Which is not much every second, right? That's about $3 a day. Um, $1 every eight hours or so, etc. It's not much money that you're withdrawing every second. You know, it's fractions of a cent. But you're imagining that you're withdrawing continuously. Let B be the balance. And T V time, this is in dollars, and this is in years, because the interest rate is an annual interest rate. It's compounded continuously, but it's an annual rate. Your money's going to grow by approximately 2% per year if you don't withdraw, but we are withdrawing. Can we figure out a formula for the balance as a function of time and answer questions like, well, will we ever run out of money? That might be a good question to want to answer. Will you ever run, run out of money in this scheme? Here's the key. The rate of change, dB dt, can be described in terms of the interest rate and the fact that you're withdrawing money at a rate of $1,000 a year. How? Well, if you, if you were not making withdrawals, withdrawals, just focus on the annual interest rate, dp, dv dt would be 0 0.02 times b. Does that make logical sense? Well, maybe it does to you, maybe it doesn't. Effectively, you're saying here, if you think about your initial deposit, if you imagine b equaling 100,000, 2% 2 of 100,000 is 2,000. This is saying at time zero, Right when you have the money in there, your money is growing at a rate of $2,000 a year. If you're not making any withdrawals, it's going to continue growing at a rate that's essentially 2% of the given balance at any moment in time. As your balance keeps going up, that rate does keep increasing, though effectively, instantaneously speaking, at any moment in time, it's 2% of the current balance that does reflect this annual interest rate compounded continuously. What about the fact that we were withdrawing money at $1,000 a year? That is taken care of by just subtracting 1000 We're withdrawing money at a rate of $1,000 a year. If we were only withdrawing money, you could call the differential equation, you could write it as dBT equals negative 1000 if you were only withdrawing money at a rate of $1,000 a year. That would tell you the rate of change of your balance over time. But where both things are happening, so we get the differential equation that combines the two. All right, let's solve the differential equation. Separate variables. dB over 0 0.02 B times a th minus 1,000 would equal dT. So we've separated variables. Now we integrate both sides. Right hand side is What's typically happening for us is easy to integrate. The left-hand side is always harder. It's going to involve a natural log of the absolute value of 0.02b minus 1,000. But it's not, you can't stop there. 
The derivative of that would get an extra factor of 0 0.02 when you use the chain rule, so you need to divide by 0 0.02 as well, which is the same as multiplying by 50. I could write 50 there instead. The goal here is to solve for b. b is a function of t. I can multiply both sides by 0 0.02 and then exponentiate. I'll do two steps at once here. Point, absolute value point zero 0.02b minus 1,000 equals, if I multiply both sides by point zero 0.02, initially I get point zero 0.02t plus c2. Question? It is the point 0.02, do we have to take that out because of the chain rule? Yeah, you have to divide out because of the chain rule. If you differentiate this, we okay. get an extra factor of point zero 0.02 that will have to cancel with that one. Okay, and is it... Does that say 1 over 0 0.02? Yep, 1 over 0 0.02. Okay, so why, why would it be 1 over? I'm just wondering. Because of the chain rule, you're going to end up, when you differentiate this, you'll get another factor of 0 0.02, the derivative of the inside. Mm -hmm. It's got to cancel with that 0 0.02 because you don't see a 0 0.02 over here. Oh, yeah. Okay. If you did a substitution, W equals 0 0.02B minus 1,000, DW would be 0 0.02DB, and dB would be 1 over 0 0.02 times dW. And the point 1 over 0 0.02 would come from that as well. Thank you. Um, we have e to the 0 0.02t plus c1, or plus c2, if c2 is 0 .01, 0 0.02 times c1. But that c2 could come out in front because properties of exponents. I might as well just call it c2 here. C2 e to the point zero 0.02t. If you get rid of the absolute value signs, which we always end up getting rid of, you could call it C3 instead. Or maybe just C now. And solve for B by adding 100 and then dividing everything by 0 0.02. So we could write, adding 1,000, excuse me, 1,000 uh, plus C. We're going to just call it c now, to the 0 0.02t divided by 0 0.02. I did two steps going from here to here, and I also did two steps going from here to here. Here I, again, multiply both sides by 0 0.02 first, then exponentiate to get rid of the logarithm <laughs> to get there. Then I got rid of the absolute value signs. I guess it's three steps. Added 1,000, then divided by 0 0.02 to solve for b in this next line. 1,000 divided by 0 0.02 is the same as 1,000 times 50. It's 50,000. Maybe I should have called this C3 because I'm going to now do C3 divided by 0 0.02. I'm going to call that a C4 or just a C. you see that okay? Zoom in if you need to there. Just 50,000, not 5,000. Yeah, 50,000, thanks. 50,000 plus c e to the point zero 0.02t. There's your general solution. By the way, it is always worth checking these things, checking that this general solution works. If you're feeling uncomfortable, what about whether you've done it right or not? It should solve the differential equation. Its derivative should be point zero 0.02 times itself minus 1,000. What's its derivative? dv dt. Look at that formula over there. The derivative of 50,000 is 0. The derivative of c e to the 0 0.02 t is 0 0.02 c e to the 0 0.02 t. Is that the same thing as 0 0.02 b minus 1,000 when you plug in the function in place of b? So you've got to multiply that by 0 0.02. 50,000 times 0 0.02 is 1,000. plus 0 0.02c e to the 0 0.02t, then we subtract 1,000. And the 1,000s cancel, and we get a match. This matches this. It is a solution, no matter what it That's your general solution. What about a solution that satisfies the initial condition that our initial deposit is 100,000, B of 0 is 100,000. 
B of zero is 100,000. We want to solve for C. 50,000 plus C to the point zero 0.02 times zero should equal 100,000. I'm just taking the solution, plugging in T equals zero, and setting the result equal to 100,000. This is one here, so it looks like C is going to be 50,000. 100,000 minus 50,000. So the solution of the initial value problem is 50,000 plus 50,000 e to the point zero 0.02t. Will we ever run out of money? No, in fact, our money's still going to grow. Even though with, we're making withdrawals continuously, our money's still going to grow. That should make intuitive sense because you're only withdrawing at $1,000 a year, whereas a 2% annual interest rate is going to give you approximately $2,000 a year at the start. So even though you're making the withdrawals, the money does grow here. The graph of this is going to look like this, this 100,000 here. Would that happen for all initial deposits? Would, would it grow in this situation? If you were drawing money at $1,000 a year? No, it's not going to happen for all initial conditions. And that's the benefit now of trying to figure out what the phase plane looks like. And actually, something I want to emphasize today that's new is if you graph this right-hand side function as a function of B, it's helpful for figuring out where the equilibrium solutions are and what the other solutions in the phase in the um, slope field look like. Here's what I mean. If I let f of b equal that right-hand side function, 0.02b minus 1,000, if I graph that as a function of b, what does it look like? Well, it's a straight line with a slope of 0 0.02 and a vertical intercept of negative 1,000. It's going to look like that. This is negative 1,000 here. Negative 1,000, not negative 10,000. What's the uh, intercept there? Set this equal to 0 and solve for b. The intercept <laughs> will be b equals 1,000 over 0 0.02, 50,000. This function is positive when b is bigger than 50,000 and negative when b is less than 50,000. Coming back to the differential equation, that means db dt, the derivative of your balance over time, is positive when b is bigger than 50,000 and negative when b is less than 50,000 and zero when b equals 50,000. Zero, the constant function, excuse me, 50,000, the constant function 50,000 is an equilibrium solution. The slope field is going to have an equilibrium solution at 50,000. If your initial deposit is 50,000 and you are withdrawing money, and there's this interest rate as well. You're withdrawing money continuously at a rate of $1,000 a year. Your balance is going to stay constant. We started out above 50000 Our solution was increasing and concave up. It turns out other solutions that start out above 50000 are increasing and concave up. On the other hand, we also have a non-zero slope at the beginning. On the other hand, if you start with the balance below 50,000, the solution is going to be decreasing and concave down. And you're going to run out of money eventually if your initial balance is below 50,000. And you could, once you have the formula for such a situation, for example, if your initial deposit was 40,000, once you have the formula for that, you can figure out what time you're going to run out of money. Sometime right there, you can solve an equation involving setting this function equal to zero when your C 
includes the initial condition that your starting deposit is 40,000, setting that equal to zero and solving for t with logarithms will tell you what time you're going to run out of money. This constant function, this constant is a solution. It's called an equilibrium solution. As I did briefly talk about the other day and you read about, equilibrium solution. Since nearby solutions move away from it as time increases, it's unstable, right? You read about that too. It's an unstable equilibrium solution. If I got Mathematica to make the slope field for me, we would see a picture that mirrors what you see here. Okay? Before I do that, just again, also make sure you understand the distinction between these two things. This picture is of the solutions in a slope field, although I didn't draw the little slope marks. This picture is not, this is not a solution. This is a graph of the right-hand side of the differential equation as a function of b. The point of making this graph was to help me figure out what the solutions look like. That was the point. And you're going to have a few problems here to do that on the next assignment. Let's go ahead and have Mathematica make slope field for this example for us. Look down here, again, the, the syntax is vector plot. I showed this to you last time. Vector plot, you make a list. Inside the list for slope fields, you always put a 1 first. We're going to talk about another kind of field called a vector field in lecture B today, and you do not put a 1 in the first spot for a vector field. But for a slope field, for these kinds of differential equations, you put a 1 in the first spot. In the second spot, you put the right-hand side of the differential equation. 0.02b minus 1,000. Because that's the expression that's going to give you the slopes of your solutions. The slope of your solution at any particular point is given by that quantity. That's what the differential equation is saying, so to speak. 0.02b minus 1,000. T is the independent variable. B is the dependent variable. This will make a slope field, though it's not quite ideal because ideal there'll be a bunch of vectors instead of line segments. And wow, that's, that's kind of crazy looking. Uh, let's see, how can I make this better? Let me try the vector scale option. See what that does. Not much better. Oh, I think I want to make this a point zero three as well. Hmm. Let me reduce the plot range. It's t. It's making the plot range for t a lot bigger than I wanted it to. That seems to be the problem here. So let me change the plot range. 0 to 20 in the horizontal direction and 0 to 200,000 in the vertical direction. That looks better. Though it is making them arrows still. Uh, how can I make those be just little line segments? Let me try 0.01 instead of 0.03. Okay, that's better. Still not quite as pretty as I was hoping for, but good enough. So our solution started out in an initial condition of 100,000. It follows the slope field. That's what the differential equation is saying to do. Solution should have a derivative of slope equal to the value of this expression at any point. So any time it passes through one of these things, I think at the midpoint, actually, it's got to be tangent to it. So your solution ends up looking like this. Let me let t go past 20. Let's go out to 100. That might look prettier. OK, well, it's different. So your solution is going to look like this. If the initial condition is 50,000, there is an equilibrium solution that's constant. You can see these other slope marks close to that are almost horizontal. And if your initial condition is below 50,000, then the solution heads toward zero. And I could draw these solution curves 
graph these functions on top of the slope field, but I won't take the time to do that during lecture A here. Maybe during the break I'll do that and we can see what it looks like at the beginning of lecture B. Another model. So, so far we've done cash flow with interest. And we talked about slope fields and right-hand side functions. So let's do another model of mixing problem called compartmental analysis in your book. Sort of a fancy name. I just prefer calling them mixing problems. I'm going to imagine I have a vat. And this vat has a, some sort of propeller-like thing inside of it that spins and mixes up the fluid inside. I really draw a propeller so well. Pretend this is a propeller that's, maybe I need propellers on both sides, that mixes up the fluid, the water. It's actually it's going to be salt water in here really well. And pretty much instantaneously, they, they spin really fast, and the salt water gets mixed up pretty much instantaneously so that the concentration of salt is effectively uniform. That's the idea. Let's say it can hold um, 50 liters total. That's how much the vat can hold. And it starts out with, say, 10 uh, liters to start with of pure water, pure H2O at the start. Water is leaving the mixed water, mixed salt water is leaving the tank at a rate of, let's say, five liters per minute, and entering the tank at six liters per minute. The salt water that's coming in has a fixed concentration. Well, I don't know what, what a natural concentration for salt water would be. I, I'm just going to make something up here. Let's say two grams per liter. Two grams of salt for every liter. Just made that up. The question is, in this situation, what is the amount of salt in the tank as a function of time? What is the amount of salt as a function of time? Maybe zoom in on what I'm writing here because it's kind of small. What is the amount of salt as a function of time? And based on that, we could try to answer questions like, uh, when does the amount of salt reach five grams or something like that. Use the differential equation to model this. The differential equation we're going to write down here is based on the assumption that I've got these fans in here that are mixing things up, although if I put them in the middle there, I guess it doesn't start mixing it up right away. So maybe I should have drawn them on the bottom here. Okay. Ignore the fact that initially they're not in any fluid. Pretend they are always mixing things up really well, really fast, effectively, instantaneously. If A is the amount of salt in grams, and T is time in minutes, can I find a differential equation that models how the amount of salt changes over time? And the basic principle of these kinds of problems is it's, well, it's, it's rate in minus rate out. Salt water is coming in. And even though the, it's pure H2O to start with here, once the salt starts coming in, it's going to be there. There is going to be a certain rate of change in the salt water going out, and the amount of salt going out. It's rate in minus rate out. That's the basic principle in this model. 
What are the units of these rates? Well, the units for A are grams and the units for T are minutes. So the units for the derivative, the ADT, has got to be grams per minute. Same with the rate in and rate out. The unit analysis is very helpful in figuring out what the equation is going to be. You really have a constant rate coming in. The concentration of salt is 2 grams per liter in the salt water coming in. It's coming at a rate of 6 liters per minute. That's the overall fluid salt water coming in. That's how fast it's coming in. You can multiply those things to figure out how fast the salt itself is coming in because the liters will cancel. Mm -hmm. Two grams per liter times six liters per minute. The liters cancel, giving you 12 grams per minute is how fast the salt is coming into the tank. Talking about the salt, not the blue. That becomes a 12. The rate out is a bit more complicated. You are going to have a certain concentration in grams per liter and a certain flow rate in liters per minute that you still have to multiply. The flow rate is the easy part. It's labeled here. The fluid is leaving at 5 liters per minute. The trickier part is the concentration. It's changing over time. It's not it's not 2 grams per liter because the starting amount of, of con concentration of salt here at the start is not 2 grams per liter, it's zero. It's pure H2O at the start. Well, at any moment in time, the number of grams is A. And the number of liters is a little tricky here. 10 liters to start off with. And because it's coming in 1 liter per minute faster than it's leaving, the volume is 10 plus T. That's the trickiest part right there. Think about that. When T is 0, the volume is 10. Volume of fluid, salt water. Pure water at the start, though. When T is 1, after 1 minute's gone by, you've got one more liter in the tank because it's coming in at a rate one liter per minute faster than it's leaving. If I made it 2 liters per minute faster, like 7 up here, I'd have to have a 2 in front of that T. After 2 minutes, it's gone up by 2 liters. It would be 12. 10 plus T does represent the volume as a function of time. So your differential equation becomes the ADT equals 12 minus A over 10 plus T. <coughs> That's a differential equation that is actually not separable. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pi. Yep. Forgot my five. That's a differential equation that's actually not separable. You can't separate variables. No amount of manipulation is going to get all the A's on one side and all the T's on the other. You can try it, you won't be successful. So what do we do? Have mathematics solve it for us. Okay. You won't have to solve one like this by hand, but we can have Mathematica solve it for us. We can use d solve or d solve value to solve it. It is a simple enough equation that it can be solved, and there are methods to do it by hand. I'm just not teaching you those methods. Separation of variables doesn't work. That's the only method we don't. d solve value for, will solve it for us, though. A prime of T equals equals, don't forget your double equal sign, 12 minus 5A over 10 plus T, though if I just leave it like this, it's not good enough. Remember, Mathematica does need to put, uh, emphasize that A is a function of T. You need to emphasize that to Mathematica. So even though when I wrote it by hand, the A does not have an A of T here, and that is an important thing to not write that way. In Mathematica, you do need to emphasize that A is a function of T. Uh, the initial condition, A of 0, the amount of salt to start with is 0. Put that in a two-element list like that. We're solving for A of T, and T is the independent variable. 
This should give us a function that gives you the amount of salt as a function of time. Kind of complicated looking. Um, we might wonder then how much salt is in there. Well, let's make a plot of this. That would be the most interesting thing to do. So I'll just copy and paste this down here. Make a plot of it. What's going to happen during the first 10 minutes? The graph of the amount of salt looks like that. Actually, how far should we go? We should go the first 40 minutes until this is full. It's going to be full in 40 minutes. That's telling you by the end of 40 minutes, which is where this model is valid, you're going to have, looks like it might be 100 or very close to 100 grams of salt in the tank. Okay? Let's take our break.